All right, folks, let me weigh in on this. It's just a um, couple things since I haven't really done anything in the past week or so. Let me just jump in here real quick about domestic politics, which I despise. I really do despise domestic politics. I've forgotten why I despise domestic politics, but this election season has reminded me why I do. People are way too emotional, uh, way too swayed by the advertising and the personalities that are in it. And they're always influenced by the subtle, what can I say, um, brainwashing that's done over time uh, to the American people, to the American individual, which is why I don't do domestic politics very well, because you gotta fight through all that. Now, I fought my own battles over the past 40 years with being unbrainwashed and disappointed by domestic politics. And that's why I like global politics better because you can pick different key points and when you compare countries and policies from different countries, uh, it takes the emotion out of it because it doesn't matter what the sales pitch is. When you're talking about um, referencing one country's policy versus another, or a block of countries' policies versus another, you get down to systemic and and policy-based and outcome-based evidence. And that's, and that's all that counts in geopolitics. Domestic politics is really about emotion and electing the latest class president, whether it's a city councilman, a mayor, a senator, whatever. Same thing. And that part of it I don't like. Trying to predict how people are going to pick whatever brand A or brand B they're going to pick. And a lot of it's based on the, well, really the current current emotional climate or social climate that's in the United States. And even when it comes to evidence or claims about what one president has done over the other, most people don't even look back to see what the previous administration did or whether it's their own policy or is it follow through policy or whatever. They the both sides that don't like each other will make a claim and a counterclaim. And most of the time, there's only half truths in both. So that's why I don't do uh, domestic politics very well. That being said, after that pre-ramble, there's two items that I want to get off my chest. And I'm going to take the first one first because it's the shortest. Why save it to the end? And that is Barack Obama and his comment that's floating around about why black men chose Donald Trump. And... First thing I want to say right off the bat, shut up, Barry, and sit the fuck down. Stop trying to play that female shaming language with black men. You as a constitutional scholar, a lawyer, graduated from Harvard, and been president of the United States knows that the tantamount thing is that, especially in elections, people have choice. And their choice is sacred no matter who they choose or what reasons they choose them for. You played that card very well in the eight years that you were in. So shut up and sit down, okay? Stop playing the democratic game, okay? You're not our daddy, you never were. We liked you, we called you bro, but you're not our daddy. And just because the female Democrats can't handle us because their little spankings didn't do any good, they're gonna go get big daddy and say, wait till your father gets home and he's gonna chastise you. We are not Sasha and Malia, you're not our father. You're not even Eidos. Shut up and sit down. Black men choose what they choose for whatever reason. They're raised by white people. You don't know why black men choose what they choose because you don't have our experience. So shut up and sit down and go back and tell Michelle and the rest of the Democrats that we said so. We got balls just like you do. We got a jump shot just like you do. Sit down, grab a beer, grab a good on the court, We'll play a few games of hoop, and then you'll go back to wherever you go back to, and you're going to leave us alone, right? That's all I want to say about Barack Obama. Now, the longer piece that I want to talk about is about this election and all this kerfuffle that's going on around it. And I've said this many, 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 many times. I learned this right after uh, Bill Clinton took over from George Bush, way back in 1992, 92, 93. At the end of the day, what matters most in the United States is continuity of government. And any president that takes over this huge boat, this huge system, this 
you know, this super tanker we call the United States has to abide by the rules of the boat. The boat dictates what the captain does, not vice versa. Should have learned that with Donald Trump. Donald Trump tried to be a maverick. He tried to do things his way. He tried that for a whole year and everything fell on his face, right? Donald Trump fell on his face for the first year. Flat on his face for the first year. He got very little done until Donald Trump learned a valuable lesson. You're here to manage the boat. Okay, you don't own the boat. You never will own the boat. Boat's too big. You have to work with it. America is a big boat in a, in a bigger sea. You found out that with the Middle East when you went against Iran. You can't, you can't bully blocks or you, know, you can't bully 7 billion people around. It's not gonna happen. You have to work with it. You have to work with what's there. Any president that comes into office, Barack Obama included, you have to work with what's there. You get a big pile of papers and problems you need to solve on day one. And you can't solve them all. Donald Trump couldn't solve them all. He couldn't even come close to solving them all. He never will. Donald Trump didn't have the skill to solve all this stuff. That's how come he had to bring in so many people. Some good, some bad. They were experts in what they do because he's not. A few times he almost screwed the pooch by being hard-headed. But Donald Trump did learn. That's why I give him credit. He got better. He was horrible. He was, first year he was a horrible president. Didn't mean horrible. But he got better because the job will do that to you. The job will wear you down is because the weight of the whole United States will be on your shoulders. And one stupid move can screw up a country for decades. And it's a finely oiled machine. And you could screw it up with the wrong decision for decades. That's why continuity of government from one president to the next is so important. So you won't, you are not going to see huge changes from one president to the next if they do their job correctly. Most huge changes in the United States do not come from what a president does. Most of them. Most of them is them reacting to the environment that they come into, which shows your skill as a manager. That's what people that vote for one president or, or another do not understand. And they don't understand how come I don't get emotional about one president or, or another. Because I've learned how the freaking system works. I've learned about what basically what a president faces when he comes into office. And I've seen that office humble people, including Donald Trump. If you don't get into that office, you're not humbled by the position that you hold, then you're not seeing it right. You're gonna fuck up. COVID taught Donald Trump about being humble. COVID humbled Donald Trump. COVID had Donald Trump mumbling, mumbling incoherent because he couldn't, he couldn't put his fingers on it and fix it because it couldn't be fixed, okay? That is the office of the President of the United States. It's an office that people elect you to represent. That's why it doesn't matter to me whether it's Donald Trump or Joe Biden, unless you get a start raving psychopath that jumps into that office and actually breaks the whole system, which I don't think most people want. You want a manager that will actually manage the system properly for the best interest of the American people. Some do it better than others. Some of them don't. That's why you still have people in freaking Afghanistan almost 20 years later. Continuity of government. People don't think about that. That the policies that they that that most presidents deal with, 90% of the time, is stuff that's gone on for a very long time. They don't deal with stuff that's very new. Even when it comes to a freaking wall and immigration, they've been dealing with that stuff since the the, the, the turn of the last century. It's not new. Anyway, second thing I want to get to, because I don't want this to be too long, which is another reason I don't deal with domestic politics. Because over the past 30 years, I've learned that America is not the country that you think it is. Your image of the United States that's been sold to you by your teachers and by your, your local history books have been sanitized, and even your media. America that's been sold to you is not what you think it is. America doesn't make the, its, its money the way that you think it does. And until you get into the weeds of how America makes its money and how this system is built, especially after 1945, you will not understand it. Which is why the guy that wrote Gold Dollars and Power, Tom Glavin, uh, got bought up by the Council of Foreign Relations because he knows how the system works. Which is why you see all these people that really know how the system works are in professorships. They put collars on them so they will not tell you the whole thing. So you have to take it piece by piece, bit by bit, and piece this whole puzzle together. America does not work the way you think it does. 
America does not make money the way you think it does. If you study what Nixon did with getting off the gold standard, being forced off the gold standard, Nixon didn't voluntarily get off the gold standard, trust and believe. Being forced off the gold standard in 1971. And the stagflation and the disruption, uh, financial disruption that ensued in the 1970s. People think the 1970s were a breeze. They were not. People think that uh, it was all, uh, 1970s was a golden age. They were not. Basically, 1970s, you went through austerity measures for a good seven to eight years. Then, really, you went through austerity measures for a decade. And people suffered under my austerity measures for a freaking decade. And they bury that in the history book like it was so groovy and it's so nice. It was not. But that shows you how connected this world is and has been really since the 1850s. And you don't live in a singular civilization, uh, uh, multi-polar uh, civilization, you, you basically uh, live in one. The Chinese are trying to make it multipolar. They're trying to reverse what was already done. And you think that the United States is trying to become isolationist under Donald Trump? One, number one, it, it can't happen. Number two, it won't happen. And number three, the, the United States, it, it, businessmen in the military won't let it happen because you don't make your money here. You make your money abroad. But most people don't know how the system works because they, they forget about the dollar system. They don't understand it. And I've tried my best to explain it to people, but people that can't grasp it. The United States will never be isolationist. And if it does become isolationist, you are going to suffer from it. But people don't think about that. People think Donald Trump's policies work for the American people. The only reason that's happened is because Donald Trump is willing to borrow more money to cover up his mistakes, which is why you have a Republican rebellion on the inside against Donald Trump. There's lots of key factors that we won't even go into about Trump and what has happened globally and what has backfired globally that affects us right now. We don't even want to go into that, which which proves that number one, most people don't know how this country works. And if you told them how this country works, they wouldn't believe you in the first place because they're too indoctrinated into the matrix. You unplug them, they're going to go, they will actually go ballistic. If you knew how this country works, if you knew how this country works within this global system, this imperial system that the United States has set up since 1945, you wouldn't care who the president is uh, one way or the other. You really wouldn't, which is why I don't which is why I don't do domestic politics very well, which is why when the, the word comes out that a certain person is in or out, the person's in or out. It doesn't matter whether it's cheating or not cheating or it's been scammed or not scammed. At the end of the day, when a decision is made for a president to come in, the president is going to come in whether you like him or not. And you just have to deal with him. He's going to be locked in for four years whether you like him or not. I didn't like Trump. The thing is, he's going to be locked in for four years. And his ability to manage the system is going to affect your life, your daily life, one way or the other. And what you hope is that the knucklehead will have enough skill not to fuck anything up. That's really what you want. Do your job, implement your policies, and don't screw anything up. Don't touch the wrong button. And some presidents have had their hands slapped back by touching the wrong button. Which is why, for the most part, as far as this election is concerned, I don't do a daily thing on election because basically people are way too emotional about this crap. They get way too emotionally invested in one president or the other. So I, I avoid that stuff because I'm not emotional about it. I make my own personal choice, for my own personal reason. Yay, Kanye West is who I voted for. Just because at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. And the further we get deep into this morass we call global, this, this global decline, the less that it matters. No man, no group, no uh, idea, short of going out there and, and mining the asteroid belt and bringing back uh, wealth and minerals, is gonna solve it. There's no one thing that's gonna pull the globe out of this, this decline until it hits bottom or it, it hits a termination point where whatever it's gonna go to. That can't be stopped. The United States decline cannot be stopped, okay? It can't be. Carol Quigley warned them about this back in 1965. They've been trying to prove Carol Quigley wrong for the last 60 years. 
I've been trying to prove him wrong. And so far, everything that he said has gone on like clockwork. America will decline. Now, whether the president manages it to slow it down so it doesn't hurt you too badly and we hit a soft landing or you try to buck against it and you crash the plane. No president, no system, no group of people are bigger than history. History weighs too much and once it gets rolling in a certain direction, you cannot stop it. When lava decides to flow down the hill, all you can do is get out of the way. When a glacier decides to move, basically it moves very slowly, but it's so heavy, it's going to push down. It's going to make its move. It's going to do what it does. And you don't have enough power to stop it. History is a glacier. History is lava. Once it starts to flow, it's going to flow until it decides it's going to come to rest, until the momentum stops. And once you understand that, once you understand that, then nothing else can be done about it. Then you don't worry about small things. What you worry about is where you're going to wind up in this shift. What's going to happen to you in this shift? Then you understand why white people are going to go berserk when it's really not, it's really nothing they can do about it. It doesn't matter if they kill every black person in the United States. Nothing is going to, nothing is going to stop their fate. Their fate is sealed by history, sealed by a cycle. And so is the United States. The fate, the, the fate of your history, the fate of where you're going your, your decline is going to, it's already sealed. It's already baked into the cake. Those decisions were made decades ago, 80 years ago. Set yourself out on this path, maybe even 150 years ago. You set yourself out on this path. Okay. When Lincoln turned a republic into an empire. At the Civil War, he turned this republic into an empire. You've been an empire ever since. Now, you've gotten benefits from being inside an empire. And when the empire starts to decline, you're going to get the downside of it. Because you're going to get a reduction in lifestyle. Is what it is. But I haven't really gotten involved in this stuff because I understand that very few people know how this system works. And very few people will understand how this system works. So I try not to listen to it. I try not to get involved in it because I don't want to get irritated by it. Because I know if I listen to it, I'm going to get irritated. And when I get irritated, I'm going to say probably some things that I shouldn't and I'll piss some people off. And I know it. That's why I don't really listen to it. I look at the titles. I, I might uh, sniggle a little bit and I move on. No one president can stop the flow or slowed even slow down the flow people are putting their hopes in donald trump if you put your, my god if you put your hopes and your dreams in donald trump i don't even know what to tell you if that's going to be your champion and be your hero and i've heard that from more than a few people because if it's said policies policies that you you want to cherry pick and look at you don't look at the whole totality of what donald trump has done or the direction that he possibly could have changed most people don't look at that because you want to look at the positive, which is fine. But if you put in your hopes and dreams on Donald Trump for the American people, then basically there's nothing that I can say to you. OK, and I must be straight up about it. There's nothing I can say to you. All I can say is enjoy your Kool-Aid. And I hope you got the flavor that you like, because that's what you're drinking. And you think that you're drinking a, uh, a non-liberal Kool-Aid because you don't follow the the, the popular media or you uh, follow the all what so-called alternative media that you call the alternative media and you think that you have a grasp upon it and I just shudder <laughs> it's like it's like I shudder you know like I throw up my hands I give up which is why I don't do domestic politics because if all these people talk about politics that shouldn't be and people are lost on why things happen in politics why things happen in this country which is why I laugh about this election, which is funny to me. When you think all the other elections were fair, but you think this one that's most scrutinized, the most scrutinized, <laughs> uh, maybe in American history, the most scrutinized election in American history, and you think this is the one that they, go, they choose to cheat on. Really, really. You think they cheat with paper ballots, which is the first thing that I laughed at. Oh, mail-in ballots allow them to cheat and mail-in ballots are fraudulent and mail-in and I just laughed. I just laughed. I laughed my head off. I said, are these people really serious? Not only do they know how elections work, they don't even know how election fraud works. 
So I had to I had to pull out a book, something I learned back, like I said, back in 1992. I had to pull out an old book, vote scan, and tell you how they cheat. And then all of a sudden, voila, everybody's an expert on election fraud and Dominion software. And I just breathe a sigh like, okay, you know what, y'all? And then, <laughs> and really what prompted this, man, I was listening to a brother talk about you can do a hand count election in two days. That's when I threw up my hands. I said, you know what, I'm done. <laughs> I'm dead. So, so basically, hopefully I don't have to do too much more, you know, um, election politics. I'm sure when Biden gets in, you know what, it, the, the controversies will come up left and right. So, you know, when, when he gets in, we see we have to see who his cabinet is. We have to see what his agenda is because we don't have a clue. We really don't have a clue uh, what a president's going to do until uh, he gets briefed on his, you know, hopefully he'll get briefed before his first day until he takes and sits in the Oval Office and he gets the keys to the Oval Office and they come in and they plunk down all the paperwork, all this stuff that's left over from the last administration that he has to start cleaning up and working on. Either you're going to keep some policies, you're going to reverse some, you're going to attack some, you're not going to attack some. <laughs> And until then, you have no clue of what his direction is, what his priorities are, because they will automatically shift when he actually has to sit in the driver's seat and run and actually uh, uh, steer the boat, which is why I don't even speculate what Biden will do, because I don't know. That's why I didn't even speculate what Trump would do until he got in office and he had an agenda. Nobody knows. And when he did, then you had an idea what Trump was about and what direction he was going to take. Same thing's going to go with Biden. Biden's probably even craftier because he's an experienced politician. Where Trump was an amateur, was not even an, well, he was an amateur. So Biden has a pretty good grasp about how things run because he was actually in the White House for eight years. So at the very least, the transition there will be fairly smooth. You might not like his, his some of his directions, but the transition will be fairly smooth because he's done his before. It won't be this disruption that Trump actually caused. Some people like disruption. I, at my age, don't particularly like disruption. But it is what it is. And like I said, this ramble has gone on probably a little longer than necessary. And I'm probably going to close it out here. But, you know, I just had to get a few things off my chest. Hopefully, if y'all don't come in here and start bugging me to where I have to go on a full week rant about politics and global politics. Because I don't feel like button heads with you guys and you guys have been wrong enough just in this political season. You've been <laughs> a lot of people have been wrong enough, okay? Trump lost for the reasons I thought he would lose. And he, lo he lost exactly how I thought he would lose. And he's doing exactly what I thought he would do. I told you once Trump lost, he would try to turn over the table, which he's at attempted to do. At the end of the day, Basically, this system is too big, too old, and too wieldy to let one guy turn it all over and turn it into chaos. They're not going to let him do that. And Trump, if and I'm not even going to say it here, if Trump was wise, he would take his presidential pension, you know, take his contacts, go out and make some money and be happy before he starts pissing people off that he shouldn't piss off. That's all I'm going to say about it. But with that, I'm going to jump off of here. BGS out and I will see you.